can just pull this. Good. That always makes me happy. Good afternoon and welcome to the very first presentation of TN Ethics in 2010. I never know how to say that. 2010 is acceptable, 2010 is acceptable, whatever floats your boat makes you happy to say it. But here we are, here we are. It's amazing, isn't it? And so here we are in the spring semester and we're kicking it off in high style because um, you can see the quality of our presentations. Erin, um, you want to raise your hand, please, kind sir. Our second presentation in March is being done um, on, and we've played with all kinds of titles. <laughs> the, and so we'll call it the ethics of marine science, the ethics of over harvesting the sea. And um, Dr. Erin Burge will be doing that one March 4. But today, we have with us, excuse me, Dr. Deborah, excuse me, Walker and um, Professor Gary Carson, and they're from the Department of Communications. And they're going to talk to us about something that should be near and dear to all of your hearts. And I'm planning on learning a lot because I, I hate to tell you this, I don't do any of the above. I don't even know how to get on my face or on my space or fa oh Facebook. <laughs> See, I don't even know how to say it, but let's get on. And I keep saying I don't even tweet, and um, Amanda goes, oh, "You don't Twitter." So whatever I don't do, I don't do any of it. So I'm really planning on learning. So um, th this is a very exciting way to kick off our TN ethics for the spring. Now we have some house rules if you haven't been here before. And if you have been here before, I understand that I should just put this in a recording, which someone told me because I say it every time. Let me do some house rules. Um, first of all, this is brought to you by the Jackson Family Center for Ethics and Values. And we are located upstairs at the end of the hall. We have a lending library, and we do a lot of work around campus, and you're always welcome to come and visit with us. My assistant, Amanda Price, and I, where are you, Amanda? Amanda and I are up there, and we really like visitors, so we don't have to look at each other all the time. So come up and chat, come up with your questions. Um, we also present Java Jabber in the library. And we'll have a job or jabber coming up regarding sports ethics. And at the very end of the semester, we will have a visiting ethicist, Dr. Peter French, who is phenomenal. And he's going to talk about the ethics of torture. I think, I think it'll be highly controversial. And because he happens to be a good friend of mine, it'll be a lot of fun, too. But anyway, today I want to say, if you run out of tea, we've got plenty. Please feel free to get up and refurbish your teacup. We mean for you to have an enjoyable time. If you run out of cookies, we've got those too. The only thing we'll ask you absolutely not to do is to leave while the presentation is going on. So I usually start by saying, you know what, if you don't want to stay here for one hour, you should leave now. But after one hour, I will call time, and the people who have to go may go, and then we always have people who want to stay and talk some more. Dr. Walker and Car Dr. Carson have said to me that they will um, interact, so you're going to be doing some of the talking today, and I imagine we'll get good questions and good opinions. Our main goal here is to present to you things for you to leave here talking about. So if you go out and you're not talking about it, we have indeed failed you. So I hope you have a lot to talk about with each other when this is done. I also hope you enjoy it, and I know you will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll just raise, raise it up, too, if you want. changes that has happened in the world is the digitization of information. The ability to create through a binary code a simple on or off, a zero or a one configuration that stores data, that allows us to retrieve it, and allows us to transmit information 
has transformed our interactions, our work, our families, and our lives. The change began for the average person in 1972. Some of us were mesmerized by the latest technology that came out that year, the first video game called Pong. And we sat there and we played Pong, and for those of us who had that experience, we thought it was a brave new world. What it was, was on your TV screen, you had two lines on either side and a dot ball moving back and forth, and you tried to beat your opponent at a game of tennis. It was a direct consequence of the innovation of what went on in the NASA space program, where the Apollo uh, space program took two identical computers of 74 kilobytes of memory and four kilobytes of RAM, literally the computing power that you have in your car remote control. And that they went to the moon and back with that. And this digitization started spreading throughout society to become a significant part of our work lives and more and more of our non-work and our leisure activities. The digitization of information has moved us into an area where time and space are made irrelevant. Where we all have elephant memories we can never forget and no one will let us forget. Where we can access tremendous amounts of information, some of it credible and some of it not so credible. Where misinformation can be propagated in ways that would make the proponents of the great lie theory jump for joy where the private and public has been so blurred that they meld into one sometimes very uncomfortable unit. Where indiscretions and immaturities become public fodder. Where contextualized statements and meaning making for specific situations has been lifted in a form of proof texting that does damage, damage to the meaning, the intent, the careers, and the reputations of people, organizations, and institutions, where the ethical rules of the past have been abrogated and the usage of technology has created interfaces of relationships and the loss of control of information. Even though the sight of these tensions may be new, conflicts between the public and the private, freedom of expression and censorship of expression and ethical procedures for the dissemination of ideas. These are issues that have been around for a long time. In our own country, our early nation builders linked virtue with ethical behavior. For example, Ben Franklin suggested that two of our most important virtues were justice, to do right by others, and moderation, to avoid extremes, especially the extremes of emotional response. Several centuries later, William Bennett, former Secretary of Education for our country, echoed some of those themes in his Book of Virtues that included as virtues important to Americans, compassion, responsibility, and honesty. Martin Buber, a German-born philosopher, outlined the foundations of dialogic communication by maintaining that there is a significant difference between engaging the world and manipulating it for one's own ends. Hergen Habermas, another German philosopher and public intellectual, wrote his two-volume work, The Theory of Communicative Action, in which he justified the use of what he called norms in establishing open yet ethical communication. Neil Postman, the founder of the Media Ecology Program at New York University, suggests that every new technology always presents us with a brand new Faustian bargain, a new potential deal with the devil. As Postman was fond of saying, technology giveth and technology taketh away. A new technology sometimes creates more than it destroys. Sometimes it destroys more than it creates, but it is never one-sided. And so as Dr. Carson has observed, here we are where titillation masks hunger, where desire is mediated as if it could ever be fulfilled, 
where salacity pretends to be interest, where insult and injury become factual and public, where manipulation gets disguised, disguised as engagement, and where increasing discourse always also decreases discourse. So today we're going to look at the tip of the iceberg because time does not permit an in-depth consideration of the myriad of implications and the usage and the consequences of digitization and the ethical views that they call forth for us to consider. We hope to engage, not so that we stand here and lecture and talk to you about something you know a whole lot about, because our lives are immersed in this. We are filled with this every day, and it becomes more and more part of our lives. So we hope that we can talk about this, that you can tell us stories. We hope to be able to relate to some of the factors that uh, we have been dealing with for years as researchers and scholars. So I'd like to begin with a story that I ran across. Uh, a mother was telling me a couple uh, years ago about something that went on in her family. She had said, being someone who was, uh, in her words, a little bit uh, computer challenged, she had sent an email to her daughter-in-law. And in the email, in the normal relationship that she had, she used a little humor and she used a little sarcasm and she talked about events that were going on and things that were going to come uh, up in the future. And in talking with that, she thought it was just a normal, regular email. She received an email back from her son. She sent it to the daughter-in-law, who forwarded it to her husband, who then sent back, shall we say, a less than kind analysis of the words that he had spoken to his dear wife and went on not only to defend his wife's honor, so he thought, but then to bring up and dredge up all kinds of things that went on in the past and the wrongs that had been done to him and the ways in which he, he felt misused and mistreated in the family and now it was transferring to his wife. And then it got ugly. <laughs> and it got ugly because what happened was that Pardon me. She got that email and it was heart wrenching for her, she told me, that the email was then became a subject of discussion of other members of the family because everybody now had access to it because it was talked about in conversation. It was forwarded along to one another and everybody did their own parsing of what was meant, what was intended, what was really said, what was the context of the situation and a big family brouhaha went on for six months. And finally, after all of this time, she said, I finally started talking to my son <laughs> and talking directly again to my daughter-in-law, and we tried to deal with all the problems. She said, I guess I'm not very good at writing these email things that we're supposed to be doing, but it certainly did take off quickly and get much bigger than we ever intended. The use of emoticons in email transitions and in text messaging really kind of gets at what Dr. Carson's talking about. When digital communication first became very popular and very available to all of us, we usually used uh, the colon and one of the parentheses as the emoticon to let people know that we were joking, that we were laughing, that we were trying to tease them. And now, of course, in the newer versions of everything from word processing programs and email programs to the newest versions of your, your cell phones, you actually have several pages of emoticons because the words that you use themselves in your messages generally aren't able to convey the sarcasm the humor, the irony, the emotion that you want to. So we have emoticons for everything from frowns and smiles to cute little winks to let people know that there's a different level of meaning going on. When someone sends you a message and it's all in caps, what are they doing? They're yelling at you. How did you learn that? How did you learn that caps is, is a greater volume? It shows authority. <laughs> I have a friend 
who can't see very well, so she types all in caps. She sends me emails, and I say, why didn't Hover get me? And we went, went into this big, long discussion about it. How many of you have to send two or three emails to explain the first email that you sent? <laughs> to, try to try to deal with the issue. Any stories on email transmissions that you care to share? Things that you sent that blew up, like uh, this lady that I met at this uh, party? Talk to me about it. You don't have to give details, of course. What's LOL mean? <laughs> BTW? How do you know? Because we use them all the time. The meanings have become so widespread that even if you don't use those particular abbreviations that often, you know the code, you know what it means, you know how to type in, in a text message, you see whatever you want to see, right? And you know that that's not spelled out Y-O-U. And transformation of language takes place, and text messaging becomes part of it. I find myself stopping as I'm writing on the board for my students because I want to use text messaging uh, encryption in order to be able to do it. I want to write for instead of F-O-R, and I want to write uh, all these things. The code that we may use in our own notes and things like that. But the thing about the digitization is that you lose control. That just as this interpersonal reaction between a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law now gets replicated so that everybody can see it and now gets be becomes the focus and fodder for other types of things. Our government knows a little bit about that. <laughs> In fact, there's some work being done on analyzing the text messages and the emails back and forth between Argentina and Colombia. <laughs> and things that go on with that. And some scholarly papers will come out with that. So we run into this, and while it is a great tool, now, when you first encountered emails, those of us who are old enough to know when we used to write hand notes and things like that. One of the things that we were told was that it's a simple way of communication. Is there anything simple about it? There's all kinds of meaning that takes place beyond that which is presented in the words that are there. And so you miss all the nonverbals, you miss all the different or all the other cues that we utilize in language and in the transmission of ideas back and forth. The message can't be softened via text or email by me reaching out my hand to you, by touching you, by smiling at you when I'm talking to you. The intent of the message has to only go on the words, and in this case, not even words, on the U and the R and the C that we are all supposed to understand, decode, and be able to communicate by. I'm assuming that when you do emails and when you do text messages, you use perfect punctuation and grammar just as if you were turning in an English composition to Dr. Raise, Sanders, raise right? You raise your hand, all you perfect communicators. Funny how all of you aren't raising your hand. What's up with that? Dr. Carson has a student who began dating someone who used perfect punctuation in all of his emails. And text messages. And text messages. After a while, she, uh, she said, I can't continue this because it's taking me too long to respond. Because I don't know how to get all the, all the things right in there. She found that she was becoming so frustrated and so obsessed with her own self-presentation as she tried to continue to maintain all of the punctuation rules and grammatical rules that she knew this new intimate partner would be looking for. She decided she couldn't continue with the relationship anymore. And she it, began to wonder if there was something wrong with her. And she began to wonder why someone would utilize this short, fast, easy, brief mode of communication and yet take such care with the punctuation, the grammar, and the intent of the meaning. And so we move not just from the digitization of text, but now, and one of the things that has really blossomed in this last decade has been the availability of images and the ability to send images back and forth and the ability to alter images and to create your own images, which raises all kinds of ethical issues about how to deal with this. We, we've seen in the textual transmission that it can get out of control, that things are said for people that it was not intended. 
that interpersonal activity now becomes part of uh, everybody else. It's uh, wanting to explain to a fellow coworker why you hate your boss, and instead of sending it to reply to him, you hit reply all, so that everybody in the company sees your opinion of the boss. All right, that's the kind of spread that goes on. But we now also have the ability for the images in the video. Right, now we have a convergence of the textual and the image, right? And Dr. Carson was telling me, I hadn't read the news today, but Dr. Carson was sharing with me um, just recently an athlete who's yes, been... Greg Oden, yeah. Tell us the story, Dr. Singh. Greg, Greg Oden, uh, number one pick in the NBA draft last year, seven foot one, University of, uh, no, wait, the Ohio State University. Uh, uh, sent a sex text. What's a sex text? It's when you text someone sexually explicit material. Including usually, pictures. In, usually pictures or videos of yourself or others sexually engaged or naked. And so he sent a sex text to his girlfriend last year of him standing in front of the mirror naked uh, and taking a picture with his phone and sent it to her, and that was released and has, is on the internet. I haven't looked, but Dr. Carson, of course, wanted to examine those images for us today. So, I, and I mean, there he is in all his glory. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a big problem for him, contract-wise. It's a problem for him in a, in a wide variety of ways. And something that he now has to look at as far as his contract is. Right. As to whether he's in violation of his contract in, in maintaining a certain amount of heat or a certain type of heat. Uh, the blogosphere is going crazy today because the implications of how that's going to affect his NBA prospects, his chances at getting the most lucrative contract that he can, his ability to attract the sponsorships that are going to lead him to become economically viable are all now possibly at risk. The link of text and video is, can be troubling enough, but especially when you have social networking sites like Facebook and MySpace, where video and pictures become the primary mode of communication, you still now have this even more intense link between the textual and the video. So let me share a story if I can. <clears throat> Lenny is mean. That's how it started. One of my nieces posted on my husband Lenny's Facebook account on Sunday morning. Lenny is mean. Within an hour, two of my best girlfriends had seen it and had immediately called me up. I informed them that I don't go on Facebook and would not be intervening in the Facebook post. All of my girlfriends then decided to post their own responses, defending my husband and questioning the motive for my niece's post. My niece then posted back, informing everyone that her post wasn't anyone's business. My friends immediately replied that since my niece had posted in the public forum known as Facebook, what began as an apparent family misunderstanding had now become everybody in the world's business. My niece's mother then began a series of postings threatening everyone with legal action if they continued cyber-stalking her daughter. Several people then posted the rules of Facebook usage on my husband's Facebook account and threatened to report my niece and her mother for misuse of the terms of Facebook. My husband has now decided to deactivate his Facebook account. My friends are upset. My niece and her mother are upset. And still, as of today, Thursday, no one has actually communicated with anyone via anything other than electronic communication. All this happened Sunday morning between 9.20 p.m. and 11.20 p.m. I'm sorry, a.m. How many of you have Facebook or MySpace accounts? How many of you have had any problems with those? What kind of problems? What kind of things have gone on? Like people tagging me and stuff, but I didn't even know they took me. 
What's tagging you mean? It's where they attach a name to a photo, and now they can put it in their status even. They can attach a name. So someone can take a picture of me, put it on an account, attach information to it, and if I have particular types of programs, can't I also then alter that picture? Anybody else? What else kind of problems do we have on Facebook? MySpace. Any others? What's, I use the term cyber stalking. What's that mean? What's stalking? If I'm stalking you, what am I doing? I'm watching you, I'm following you, I'm bugging you, I'm calling you, I am intruding in your privacy without an invitation. Cyber stalking then? Same old thing, just doing it electronically, right? It's considered one of the newest forms of bullying and assaults and deaths have been linked to it. Yeah, the whole idea of flaming, of taking somebody's reputation and ruining it by making accusations and we run into a world where if you listen to the news closely, you will find that the news will say so-and-so on such-and-such such a blog said this. And so you get into the whole idea of credibility where people can make accusations. I mean, Matt Dredd started his whole uh, career, if you will, by taking what many considered to be rumors about what was going on in the Clinton presidency and posting them as uh, legitimate and people have done studies and probably 50% of what he puts out there is accurate or it has some uh, part of accuracy and the rest of it is not. But it is considered to be, because it comes from that report, it is considered to be something that is legitimate. And that goes on over and over and what happens is a blog goes out there and it gets quoted in the newspaper. It gets quoted then on the, uh, on the radio news and finds its way spread throughout the society so that you then have to deal with these kind of things. Same goes for the images. People see images and the way in which these things are sent out and then even if they've been altered, you know, there's all kind of famous things where uh, magazines have altered the pictures of people to make them look more sinister. In the O.J. Simpson trial, Time Magazine put a picture of him uh, up there where they made him appear darker, gave him uh, a beard, or not a beard, but a, a, he was unshaven, in order to try to make him look more menacing because they thought the trial was not going the way they thought it should go for this African American man in a white man's society. A Latin American, a Spanish legislator, has just recently threatened to file suit because his image was used without his permission in order to accelerate photos of what we think Osama bin Laden might look like now. So they took the way the Spanish lawmaker looked and used it and merged it with the present image of Osama bin Laden to create this digitally enhanced prediction of what Osama bin Laden might look like if he's shaven, if he's cut his hair, if he's made other alterations. In using the Spanish lawmaker's image without his permission, um, they have now been threatened with lawsuit if they continue to release these possible images of what they say could be what Osama bin Laden might look like at some point or another. So think about what Dr. Carson's saying. An anonymous blogger posts something on a web forum and within hours it has now been legitimized and is being reported as bona fide fact. Suppose you were written about on a blog. Specifically, ladies, Suppose someone called you a nasty skank. An anonymous blogger called model Liscula Cohen a nasty skank, among other things. Liscula Cohen filed suit demanding that the blog host, a little teeny company you might have heard of called Google, reveal the blogger's identity. They did. Her name is Rosemary Port. Rosemary Port has now launched a $15 million lawsuit against Google for disclosing her identity. Google spokesperson Andrew Peterson has said that while his company sympathizes with victims of cyberbullying, 
They also take great care to respect privacy concerns. However, in response to a subpoena or other court order, they will indeed provide information about a user. They are now vigorously defending against the lawsuit and the disclosure of her name. So we have all kinds of different things where there seems to be violations of individual like rights, or there seem to be that because of the digital media that is out there, because of things you can do with it, where you thought you were protected, you're not protected, such as at work. The fact that uh, what goes on at work can be followed. Every keystroke that you have, programs are written, many organizations have this, where they're following what goes on and what you do. I knew somebody, a couple with two kids, he was a computer programmer making $125,000 a year, came home, told his wife he lost his job. Because during his lunch time, he was going on to bondage porn sites at work. And they had talked to him about it, and he thought, being a computer programmer, he had put a block so that they couldn't see his computer. You know how sometimes you see in the movies where they take one image and they run a loop? That's what he thought he was doing. And it turns out that uh, they were able to see behind it, and he lost his job because of it. People have lost their jobs for a wide variety of reasons that have nothing to do with work. A couple in Fort Lauderdale, teachers in the school district there, uh, were somehow shown, I, I don't think it was intentional on their part, but there was a swinger website that they were participating in sexual activity in a swinger forum, and it was shown on there, they lost their jobs. All kinds of things happening because we have these uh, ability to project these images, and then once you're, they're projected, they get taken away, or they get taken anywhere that, uh, that somebody wants to take them. And that's creating all kinds of issues, especially when you deal with things like child pornography. Isn't child pornography, if you make a, a computer-generated image, a CGI image of children in sexual positions? What do you think? Should that be banned? Should you be arrested for that? I had those images sent to my computer an image of a child engaged in a sexual activity with a horse. It was repulsive and disgusting. I immediately called the FBI to report it and see if we could launch an investigation into how those images were being disseminated and distributed. The FBI told me that their hands were tied. There was nothing they could do. It was only child pornography if it, pornography if it portrayed real children and that these were obviously doctored images. They refused to investigate. My question then was, how do I get this out of my computer? I want no record of this transmission in my drive. I was told that that would cost lots of money and I would need to hire a computer professional if indeed it could be done. The FBI certainly was not going to help me out. So every website you visit, every keystroke you make, Every picture that you download and upload and uh, deal with through your computer, there's a record. That can be utilized against you, can be seen where you're going, what you're doing, the types of activities that you are engaged in. And so you don't have control over this, which is one of the big issues of this whole digitization. We take these little zeros and ones, these little binary codes, and it creates for us what we think are great tools. You know, the ability to get in there and take a picture of your uh, uh, family on a, a vacation. You can crop it, you can turn it, you can add different background, you can put it on a, a Christmas card. You can do all kinds of things with it, as can anybody else. I have a daughter who does some modeling. She has a website, she does some modeling work and puts it up there, and uh, she has to buy software to try to prevent people from taking her images and doing things with them that are inappropriate that would ruin her modeling career, her promotional career in doing things like that. And we see it on the context of advertising and humor all the time. We're all familiar with everything from the dancing baby to the talking Obama heads, right? But think about the implications for your job. 
Think about the implications for your future, for your career. 44% um, of businesses recently surveyed don't allow their employees, I'm sorry, 44% of businesses recently surveyed encourage their employees to learn about social networking sites in order to help with their own businesses, marketing, and business opportunities. And yet, more than 60% of companies won't allow employees to visit these social networking sites. In addition, increasingly, employers and future employers are mining those sites and visiting those sites and accessing those sites through the incredibly shared networks that we all have in order to check you out for employment purposes. We've heard of more than one employer relate story about hiring decisions that were not made because people who had shared Facebook accounts and friends in common were able to access your Facebook account, look at the pictures of you on spring break in Cancun, and decide that you weren't really the kind of person that they wanted to hire for their company. I recently had a friend who was discharged from a job because her credit report had become part of her personnel file as part of the requirements of that job. We've had friends who have been fired for everything from illegal email transmissions to going on sites, not just sexually related sites, but a variety of sites. Um, huge amount of discussion um, as we prepare for Super Bowl, as we take care of football. Um, people are getting fired because they're visiting their fantasy theme sites or their ESPN sites during the frenzy of March Madness or during the frenzy of the football preparation. So we've got some implications that affect our employment, our reputation, and our prospects, even separate and apart from the really funny dancing baby or the really fun and talking, talking Obama head, right? So that which used to be personal and private becomes, because of digitization, available to everyone. We have seen all kinds of scandals, and you can recall different names of people who, for uh, whatever reason, they decided to do this, uh, of photographing each other nude or, or in sexual activity that then becomes available on the internet because a year down the road or six months down the road or next week when they break up, uh, somebody gets angry and puts that up there. Uh, there are websites out there that seek this kind of stuff. You get ads for it every once in a while in your spam folder. Uh, and so, you have the digitization creates a permanent record that can follow you for a long time. I predict that we're going to have a very hard time dealing with political candidates in the future. <laughs> because all their stuff is out there and none of it is hidden. And now it's no longer hearsay that so-and-so saw you smoking pot so -and -so, uh, you know, when you were back in college, because we have video now. It has been on YouTube for quite a while. Look at what happened with Michael Phelps. And so what happens is that as we see people with uh, certain characters and certain perfections and that whenever we are looking for candidates for political office, then these types of things, because of video and digitization and the storage of them and the fact that you could go back and look at things that were posted on the internet five years ago that have now been changed or taken off, you can find those on, uh, on websites that serve to hold that information. You can't, there's no culpable deniability that you will be able to be seen, and we as a people are going to have to adjust greatly what we are willing to accept with our political leaders. Because I did not inhale will no longer work whenever you have a video of it happening. And I make the point that we've often made the distinction between whether those postings and those images are ethical or not on the intent of the person who made them. There's a big difference in me deciding to, there's a big difference in Pamela Anderson deciding to post her video of she and Tommy Lee having sex online. They both decided to do it. They're marketing the video. They're making money. But in many ways, that's no different from the ESPN reporter who was photographed and videotaped nude without her consent from a peephole in her hotel room. The images are still online. The images are out there. It doesn't really matter, other than for the point of litigation, whether the images were placed voluntarily by the people in the images or not. 
By the time you can even figure out that the images are there and you didn't post them and you're mad about it and you're going to file suit, the images have already traveled all over the planet. They're out there and the consequences of that disclosure now have to be dealt with separate and apart from whether you signed a release to put them online or not. What happens once it gets out there is that anybody can use it in any way. After 9-11 happened and uh, President Bush declares war on Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, Osama bin Laden comes along and sends to uh, the TV station in uh, Al Jazeera, uh, sends a tape. And what the, the news reports do is they take President Bush in the Oval Office declaring war, and they show almost as if it is a Lincoln-Douglas debate. They show a clip from the president and a clip from Osama bin Laden, a clip from the president and a clip from Osama bin Laden. As if they were debating that you have the president of the free world, the most powerful country in the world, making statements and that giving Osama bin Laden almost equal status as he stands there in his flak jacket with the gun behind him and the Koran open on the table next to him outside of a cave, they give these parallelisms to the both of them to the point. One of the uh, commentators that wrote about it said, it's etheric jujitsu, where the companies, the news companies, are creating these tensions. And don't we know that news loves to create drama? And so now you can take these things and you can take them out of the context that they were meant for, out of the meaning that they have, without any of the uh, of the understanding of the value of them or the intent of the speaker, and now you are placing it to where you are creating a dramatic presentation that has very little to do with the actual dialogue or the parody of the people involved. And that becomes a major ethical issue. In this case, the White House requested, I think it was the IRS who made the request on their behalf, but it requested that this no longer happen. So they removed that type of, of presentation going on. And it goes beyond ethical issues. We're talking about issues of life and death. Some of you may be familiar with the lawsuit that involved the Missouri mother, Lori Drew. Lori Drew allegedly posted insults and hateful comments about one of her daughter's classmates on her classmate's MySpace page. The 13-year-old classmate committed suicide. She left a suicide note that implicated the cyberbullying that she had endured as part of the reason for her suicide. Ms. Drew was charged with a variety of felony and misdemeanor counts, many of which included unauthorized access and altering of computer images and computer websites. Uh, just a couple of months ago, U.S. District Judge George Wu acquitted Ms. Drew of all possible uh, charges related to this case. We're talking about issues of safety and of life and death. Dr. Carson and I were talking as we were preparing for this about um, the techniques that are used with terrorists. He mentioned the Bush, um, Osama bin Laden juxtaposition of images. As a result of 911, most of you I'm sure are aware that all of our email transmissions and all of our cell phone transmissions are mined routinely by the government. The government has computer programs that track the transmissions and actually runs programs to isolate particular phrases used together as a terrorist fighting tool. So phrases like bomb, World Trade Center, Al Jazeera, <laughs> Osama bin Laden would hopefully raise some red flags on the part of the feds. It apparently, according to most reports, has resulted in some wonderful inroads and the prevention of quite a bit of possible terrorist activity. The concern, of course, is most of our transmissions are now routinely monitored by the government in one form or another. Um, and keywords are listened for, and keywords are isolated. And if you use a certain sequence of keywords, and other investigation proves that there is a suspicion, the feds will show up at your door and want to ask you some questions. It's interesting that this ties into even the searches you do online. 
Dr. Carson, you want to talk a little bit about why some searches come up as number one searches and others are 18,000th on the list of a million hits? I've been doing some work on uh, the search algorithms that are utilized and how, uh, how Google and how Yahoo and how the others, when you type in certain things that you're looking for, what protocols do they utilize to isolate those things that uh, have those within it? And obviously, if you put anything out online, any articles of that, you do keywords, and those become the first thing that are utilized, and then they do the text and things like that. Well, these algorithms are imperfect. There's no such thing as a totally random search. You can't do it uh, from a logic base that is used with computers. And so what happens is that eventually, uh, the bias that is in that algorithm only presents you with certain materials that fit the bias of the algorithm, and you think that you're getting unfiltered material, making decisions on the information that you're given, uh, looking for people who are like-minded of you, if you're looking for a community to follow, things like that, and that the algorithms themselves, because of the digital protocols, the way in which it's set up, the algorithms themselves do not allow you to see a vast majority of things. And what it does in communication, we call it unit group theory, that it prohibits you from seeing certain things. In addition to that, you can go to certain services and pay to have your website get higher on the list for Google, get higher on the list for Yahoo. Uh, that's one of the ways that they make money. And so you can go about that. So the human actor, along with the digital bias, and now the human actor, based upon finances, gets involved with that. And what you think you're looking for, and you're getting all this information from all over the place, when the truth of it is that it is highly biased. In what you're doing. Most of us assume when we do an internet search that that first couple of pages, the first couple of pages that come up out of all those hits we get are the result of those sites being the most frequently accessed, having the correct combination of keywords, or having other measures of popularity or usage. Not many of us think about the fact that that number one, number two, number three site, slot, that hit that comes up on your Google search went to the highest bidder. Someone has paid Google to push that up. And what we also find out, many of you are familiar with this phenomenon as well, is websites either by virtue of volunteer or by payment getting flooded with responses, right? It's no, I mean, we all know if we have a favorite contestant on American Idol, that if you vote a lot of times, you might be able to get that contestant moved ahead um, in Dances with the Stars, for example, or some of these talent shows. So even what we think is incorruptible information based on the purity of the computer search is now subject to the marketplace and the highest bidder. So we've done way more talking than we intended. Do you have questions? Do you have examples? one ramification, Claudia, but I also think that the opposite ramification is what I'm seeing occurring. Everyone believes it. Everyone believes it. I get emails every day that I saw 10 years ago that are just as ridiculous now as they were then. Like the email that if you don't go to the buy a gas station tomorrow and don't buy gas, all the gas prices are going to fall and the government's going to capitulate to our demands for cheap gas. <laughs> not true. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Adults and educated people have some sort of ethical duty 
to um, explain what can happen if one believes everything coming out of the gate. I hate to say that because I know it's an incredible information trail. But there, and like your situation, there's so many false notions. I just got an incredible story sent to me via email about um, a political figure and that I know is wrong. But, you know, I keep thinking, so where does all of this And then sometimes you even get the email that says, oh, don't pay any attention to this. This is a hoax. Go to the, right. there's an email, there's a hoax tracking site. Yeah, Snopes, where that you can go to and check to see if the news you've gotten is real or not real, right? So I, I guess my, my larger question is, uh, as educated people then, do we have to believe everything that comes out of the gate? Because that is not the truth. Um, and I know that you have some other things that Absolutely, Claudia. And I, I talk to my students about thinking about it like a newspaper or, or a television. I, I ask my students, well, do you believe everything you see on TV? Well, no, of course not. Then you can't believe everything you see on the computer either. And I think that that type of critical reflection, double checking stories, being sensible, like you said, Claudia, trying to limit access to your information online. And, and what were some of the other solutions? Some people are shutting down. I've talked to probably 10 students this week who have had situations where they were tagged or they were flamed or images were altered or rumors got crazy and things got out of hand and they have shut down that Facebook or MySpace site. And I don't think that's a solution either. Those are social networking sites that offer all of us wonderful, wonderful opportunities, wonderful engagements, and in a lot of cases, a lot of fun. But we have to, while the courts are grappling with trying to put some laws in place to protect the competing tensions between privacy and freedom of speech, um, like one um, researcher that we were quoting from when we were looking at some of this information, um, basically it's think hard before you type or post, right? Um, think hard about what you're seeing because much of what you're seeing and much of what you're reading is either false or exaggerated. The problem though is that just as we find, found with uh, TV news, that 70% of the country, 65 to 70%, that's the only place they receive news. And that studies have shown over and over again that in the American populace that uh, we believe the vast majority of things we get on the news. And most people don't have the filters to even recognize the bias that is there. And so as educated people, our critical thinking abilities become uh, paramount in dealing with these kind of things because the bias is there in everything, the bias on the internet, there's no checking on it. Uh, another colleague of ours in the communication department, Dr. Fondren, part of his class project at the University of Alabama was to go and take Wikipedia and make Wikipedia uh, meet academic standards of legitimacy. And so they put it, they put it up there, they, uh, they received there's some kind of standard that Wikipedia gives you when you do that. And they did that, and within 45 minutes, most of the sites that they had worked on were altered by someone else. The only requirement for Wikipedia, for the dispension, for you being able to alter something, is you have to be a member of Wikipedia, 48 hours. And then you can change anything you want. We really believe it's a buyer beware world <laughs> online, just like it is in almost every other marketplace that we live and work with, within, within our culture. I, I need just to say, please, uh, because I did promise you this when you come in, that you have to pass at 5.30, it is by my watch, 5.30. Um, these two people have been so kind, and you promise to say that they will stay. Absolutely. And I think a lot of us still have some questions. So if you need to leave, please feel free to. Um, please take your cups back here. I'm going to grab some cookies and you go out and hand it up. And Claudia, we're just going to pause for a minute while folks make that transition. Thanks.